most precious and holy name I pray, amen. All right, okay. So I don't uh, really want to get into detail, but Pamela is still in the ICU at the hospital, and so we do need to continue to pray for her. Uh, she, was, she was off the BiPAP this afternoon, and I don't know if they had planned on putting it back on or not, but uh, I mean, if not, then that's a good thing. That's a really good thing. So hopefully. Um, now she does have this rather large tube that comes around and goes in her nose, and that's massive amount of stuff, air that's being forced in. And with that, she's been able to hold about 93. So we just got to keep praying. And I talked to a couple of different doctors yesterday that had called me. And, uh, you know, I voiced my opinion. And thank the Lord that they gracefully listened. Amen. And then they tried to explain, you know, what's going on to me. And, uh, but anyway, uh, we just got to keep praying and you just can't give up. And we can't assume that, well, all right, it's going to just be fine. No, we got to keep praying until it's completely finished. And, uh, I mean, four times now we came home and four times we went back. So even just coming home doesn't mean, well, okay, it's, it's okay. Uh, we just got to keep praying. And it makes me wonder, I'm really starting to wonder if there's something in my house, if there's some kind of mold or something. Uh, that when she gets back home, it starts getting everything going again. But uh, the, first of all, the ammonia, the pneumonia has never been healed. That's still, it's been in the lungs ever since and has never been better. So, but I don't know if the house has anything to do with it. But I don't know, you, you start grasping for straws when you start getting desperate. Yeah, well, I've done that, believe me. Yeah, so. Uh, keep in prayer. I've got a funeral tomorrow uh, out in uh, Dogan's for John Setter. I know you, you don't might not remember John. He worked at Back Gate and Lawn and Garden for a little bit. Joe Smith was his, his daughter. And so he passed away, and they... He passed away the 31st, and they got in touch with me because I had promised them years ago that I would do the funeral, and now the time has come. So I just really feel like I've got to keep my word. I promise. I've got to do it. Yeah, amen. Preach the gospel. And then we've got uh, Tom Beam's funeral here at the church on Monday at 11, and he's being buried over at Evergreen. So we got that going. Yeah, Monday at 11. All right, so uh, we're in Romans 15, picking back up in our study in Romans. And uh, Paul is about closing out uh, his, his, his letter to Romans, and he's, he's talking about, you know, his mission work, uh, his plans. He's given a personal message. Uh, Rari calls it a personal message and benediction. And so that uh, basically is what is going to close out chapter 15 and chapter 16. So there's a lot of different things he's going to discuss uh, in these, in these two, last two chapters. All right, so verse 14, and I don't expect that we'll get really much, at, much further than verse 14. But verse 14 says, And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. So he gives them some, some uh, commendation. He's commending them for three things. And, uh, and this is important. These are like major factors. Uh, if you can have a church where the majority of your people fit under these categories, I mean, you really got got something that the Lord can really work through and, and is powerful. And so he commends them for their goodness. 
He commends them for their being filled with all knowledge. And both of those set the foundation for the third thing. He commends them for being able also to admonish one another. So let's kind of take this one phrase at a time. For I myself also am persuaded of you, my brother. So he's persuaded, he knows this for certain, uh, that ye also are full of goodness. So he commends them for their goodness. So what is goodness? Well, the, the short answer is goodness is high moral character and living. That's one way to look at it. And are you, are you is a little bit uh, broader in its definition. And in are you, because goodness is one of the fruits of the Spirit, that's why uh, we, we have to study it on are you on Friday nights. But uh, the definition on, from are you on goodness is conforming our lives and conversations to behave benevolently toward others. And benevolently simply is a synonym for goodness. So having a disposi disposition to do good, um, possessing love to mankind, and desiring to promote their prosperity and happiness. So doing good, helping one another, genuine love for one another. And so a, a goodness like this has to be a fruit of the Spirit because Mankind, there's some people that this is kind of part of who they are, but by and large, mankind isn't good, amen? They don't exercise goodness. In fact, the work of the flesh, the opposite of goodness, is meanness, amen? And so these people were good. They had goodness. They were, uh, he commends them for their goodness. And once again, that's that having a disposition to do good possessing love to mankind, and desiring to promote their prosperity and happiness. Most people are about their own prosperity and happiness. They're not about other people. And that's sad, but that's the day in which we live. That's what a lot of people, uh, they're about what, they're only going to do what benefits them. Amen? And this same spirit uh, has permeated uh, the Christian churches all across America. In fact, there's not a whole lot of difference between the world and the churches anymore. And part of the problem was, even back years ago, is that the world and the church kept pace with each other. So you had the world that was here, and you had the church that was back here. Well, this is the problem. As the world got more worldly and wicked, wicked well, the church just moved along with it. So where the world was is where the church went. And then it just kept going like this. And so we've kept pace with the cultural change. Now uh, churches are being overrun by this mentality of, you know, you better minister to me. You better have what I want there. You better preach what makes me feel good. And that's all of the flesh. And it's sad, but you know, that's where we're at. So the church at Rome, he, he commends them for their goodness. Now the next thing he commends them for is for being filled with all knowledge. Being filled with all knowledge. Now, it's important for us to understand this is not speaking about broad human knowledge. All right? Just, you know, like Jeopardy. You see these knuckleheads get on Jeopardy. It's amazing what they know and the answers they get right. But you get to the Bible category, you know, who wrote the book of Matthew? Uh, David. I'm like, where do you come up with that? You know, this is ridiculous. And the, and the answer is right there in the question, who wrote the book of Matthew? I think it was, I think, I think it wasn't worded that. I think it was worded, who wrote the gospel, who wrote the first gospel in the Bible? And like David and some other, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Are you that stupid? You know, but then again, they'll turn around and they'll answer, you know, all these science equations and what happened, you know, in the 1700s in South Africa. You know, how do you know that? I mean, come on. Uh, but uh, I saw an interview with uh, with uh, that guy that's a quarterback for the Green Bay Packers, Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, and he he had hosted Jeopardy, and he was a contestant on Celebrity Jeopardy. 
and they asked him about his experience with Jeopardy. He, he kind of chuckled a little. He said, now you got to understand. He said, at Celebrity Jeopardy, the questions are a lot easier. <laughs> He said, if you get on real Jeopardy, he said, it's hard. He said, it's so hard, I almost couldn't read the questions. <laughs> and I thought, wow, ain't that something. But, uh, but this isn't that type of a knowledge. The, the knowledge that he's saying here, being filled with all knowledge, is a, um, it, it's a deep knowledge of God's truth. Understanding God, who he is, knowing his word. And there has been more people that walked closer to God, had a better knowledge of the Word of God, who were just every everyday people, just just farmers, just you know janitors, just everyday people, and they just stay in the Word of God. But what did you say, Linda? Yeah, Les Feldick. He was a he's a cattle rancher for crying out loud. Every time you get these guys that went to college and got their PhD, they question everything. Well, we're not really sure what this says. We're not sure what this means. It could mean several different things. And it's like, come on now. If, if you just stick with the book, and you're better off if you stick with one book, I meant one, one Bible. For me, I would recommend the King James. And you get to know the ins and outs of that Bible, and the way words and phrases are used. You, you look at it so much, so often, you get to know it. You get to understand. You get to pick up on thoughts and ideas about things. And so these people had this deep knowledge of God. And that's another thing that's lacking today in churches is there's just not enough in-depth teaching coming from pulpits and teaching podiums. It is way too shallow. And is it shallow because... The preacher himself doesn't know, and they're not doing their homework. They're just too busy planning events all the time and making sure we give a message that makes everybody happy. Or is it, you know, you know what is it? Or are, are they just ignorant? They just don't do the, do the work to know and to understand. But this is a problem in today's society. I was listening to uh, uh, Tony Evans preach today about how heaven, heaven moves earth. I think it was an old message, how heaven moves earth. And he said, to understand how heaven can move earth, you've got to understand how earth operates. And he went into an Old Testament passage. And I thought it was interesting because he pointed out in that passage how uh, all these negative things were happening to Israel, and God said he was doing it. And I thought, that's interesting because I just heard a, a preacher before that on the Christian TV saying, anything negative comes your way. It didn't come from God. And then when I saw that passage that Tony was using, I said, wow, Tony Evans is right, and he's with the Bible. That guy on TV is wrong because God allowed this stuff to happen. And he allows it to happen for a reason. And so here, uh, you know, Tony Evans was talking uh, about, uh, you know, sometimes we're blaming the devil when God's saying, if you want somebody to blame, blame me because he's got a greater purpose. He's doing something greater. And we don't always understand that. Now, in the case of Israel, God was doing what he was doing because it was disciplinary, because they were far away. And, and he pointed out in that text, and I can't remember the, the exact uh, place where it was in the Old Testament, uh, but the passage of Scripture had pointed out that uh, they were without the true God. Now, it didn't mean that they were without a God. They were without the true God. So they were worshiping. They were still doing their thing, but not to the true God. And they were without a teaching priest. And he said, that is the big thing today. He said, there's not a lack of preachers. There weren't a lack of preachers in Israel back when that stuff happened. And there isn't a lack of preachers today, but there's a lack of teaching preachers. In other words, that know the Word of God and can teach the Word of God and expound upon it. And so because of these two things, the whole society was messed up. It was all messed up. And God had to do things. He had to take their peace away. He had to take their security away. He had to do that to get their attention. 
So we kind of kind of have to keep it in context because there's usually a reason why God, if God does something, there's a reason for it. Amen? And so we need to understand that. But, uh, and there are things that the devil does. But the devil can't do anything that God doesn't allow. So come full circle, you're back with God again. Right? And so, and there's all kinds of lunacy out there. Um, you know, uh, I know people are well-meaning, and I got a, a text uh, today, and somebody had sent me this YouTube. Uh, they don't know me, because had they known me, one, they would not have sent me a YouTube of a prophet, and two, they would not have sent me a YouTube of a woman prophet. <laughs> Strike two. Strike three, the message that she got from God. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. It's the same old garbage they keep rehashing. The Christian families are going to rise up and retake the country, and the truth is going to be known, and all these people, uh, these corrupt people in the government are going to be ousted. This is the same stuff you were saying when Trump was going to get reelected, and it never happened. I mean, come on. When is enough enough? When do people begin to figure out these, this is not according to truth? And the Bible tells us if, if they don't speak according to the word, it's because there's no light in them. I mean, anybody can say, well, God told me this and God told me that. But what really ticked me off on this woman pre -pat prophet, whatever she is, I guess maybe I'm not supposed to say the word ticked off, am I? No, I don't know. I said it already. Now I said it twice. It was this. She talked about how God told her about the phony biological warfare weapon with the virus. And I said, well, you know what? Somebody forgot to give my wife the information that it was only phony because she's laying in the hospital with a real problem. Amen? That, that right there caused me to hit delete. I'm done with you. I don't need to listen to any more of your garbage. And so anyway, this is the day that you, you know, you're living where people aren't full with the deep knowledge of the word of God, the truth of the word of God. And plow boys can do it, can know this word, because Tyndale, when he gave us uh, the Tyndale translation, which was you know before the King James, and uh, when they gave, when he gave his translation, he wanted every plow boy in England to be able to read the word of God for themselves. Of course, once they were able to do that, then they were able to discover that a lot of things that were being taught by the Church of England and by the Catholic Church was not biblical. And so, uh, which caused a lot of people to end up getting burnt at the stake and the Bibles, like when Tyndale gets burned at the stake and, and they take Tyndale's Bibles and they use them for kindling. Now, uh, to show you the accuracy of the King James, uh, it lines up perfectly with Tyndale. I, I, incredible. It, you know, Tyndale, Coverdale. Coverdale finished the work that Tyndale started because Tyndale was locked in a prison for a while before he could actually finish his complete translation work. So he had the Coverdale Bible, the Tyndale Bible, uh, the Bishop's Bible, the Great Bible. Uh, the Geneva Bible was the first Bible that had footnotes in it, and that was because so many pastors were being put to death, that they didn't have time to train new ones. So somebody came across the thought of, hey, let's put notes in the margin and on the bottom of the Bible so that people can, can stay on track. Now, it was primarily uh, Calvinistic in its theology, and that's what caused the Calvinism theology to grow so rapidly during that time period. But, uh, and even, you know, even today, it's still, you know, pretty rapid. But, uh, but that's how it all got started. So that was the first study Bible. And then after that, you, you know, you had the King James. But uh, it's just absolutely incredible. And the common everyday man could know the word of God and have a deep walk and relationship with God, knowing what God's word said and not doubting any part of it. Maybe not understanding parts. There's a lot we're not ever going to truly understand, I guess. But for the most part, not doubting what it says. Amen? And so it's very important. Now, Colossians 2, 
Colossians 2, don't lose your space in Romans. But you look in Colossians and uh, can't believe I can't can't get there doing one of these back and forth. Alright, Colossians chapter 2, look at verses 2 and 3. Colossians 2, 2 and 3. There the Word of God tells us that their hearts may be Let's go back to verse 1, because I don't like just jumping in there. All right, verse 1, Colossians 2, verse 1. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. Now, there's not a period there. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So if you want to know wisdom and knowledge, you've got to know God. You've got to know Jesus Christ. Uh, There's another part uh, in there in Colossians Uh, verse number 6, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built built up in Him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And so we need to be rooted and grounded, built up in Him, established in the faith, and that's not generic for just belief, but about doctrinal belief. It's a systematic doctrinal belief of what the Bible says doctrinally, not just generic, oh, I believe. So anyway, so the church at Rome, they, are being, they uh, were commended for their goodness and for being filled with all knowledge. Now, because they had this deep, spiritual understanding of God, this knowledge of the Lord, and because they had goodness, they were filled with goodness, it laid the foundation for the third thing. So the third thing says, able also to admonish one another. Back in Romans 15, verse 14. Able also to admonish one another. Now, the, the interesting thing is that word nuthios, which is where you get the word nuthetic, nuthetic counseling. Nuthetic counseling simply means biblical counseling. Um, What happened throughout history was simply this. First of all, there was called pastoral, or what was it called? I should have wrote it down. It was called called soul care or something like that. In other words, all all the counselors, if there was a counselor in town, it was a pastor, okay? Atheism began to take hold and root, and guys like Skinner and Freud, we better to call them flawed, that would be better, but Freud and Skinner and all these psychiatrists, they were all atheists, every one of them. And that's what started your psychological movement. All right? That garbage started to permeate the colleges and the churches, and people were getting away from sound biblical teaching to what did these atheists have to say. Well, then you, you started to get a group of Christians that came along, and they tried to uh, take what these atheists were saying, and they said, well, that sounds good, and that almost sounds like this, so they wrap a Bible verse around it. And then they call it Christian counseling. That's not Christian counseling. Christian counseling, and and the best person to talk to you about this is Jim Benny. Jim Benny was, he he was a psychiatrist and a pastor, and God brought him full circle to the truth. He only does biblical counseling, and that's what he teaches teaches all preachers to do today, is counsel biblically, biblical counseling, because you don't need that. He said there was like 131 or, or 38 systems of counseling in the secular world, 
138 systems. So depending on what doctor feel good you go to, you're going to get varied opinions and advice. Now, in Christian counseling, guess what? 138. Why would the number be the same? Because they stole that stuff from the atheist and tried to make it biblical. Listen, what we need is the word of God. And so then you had guys come along uh, like Jay Adams, who uh, wrote a lot of counseling books, but he's primarily known for the book Competent to Counsel. And he came up with the term neuthetic counseling from this word, to admonish. All right, so what does the word to admonish mean? It means encouraging, warning, advising. It's a comprehensive term for counseling. It refers to coming alongside other Christians for spiritual and moral counseling. We must rely on the full su sufficiency of God's word, not psychology. Now, that, what I just told you there, that last phrase, that was a direct quote, quote from uh, John MacArthur. And you might hate him or like him, what he said was true. I want you to look at 2 Timothy real quick. Because we've got to decide, either the Bible's true or it's not true, right? Either the Bible's accurate. And the reason that people can't do biblical counseling is because they don't know the Bible. Now, the thing that I've run into a lot is people don't want to know what the Bible has to say. <laughs> they just want to be told that they can do whatever they want to do, and it's all right. And you can't do that. But 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16, notice what the Word of God says there. All right, all right. And it's important we get the first word right, some. Oh, it's not some, it's all. That means everything from Genesis to Revelation. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God, which means God breathed, amen? So you're dealing with the Word of God. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is what? It's profitable. That means it's a, of a great benefit. Does not say you need to find out what Plato and Socrates and Aristotle are saying? Those were the big psycho psychology guys back in the day when Paul was living. Amen? doesn't say that. doesn't say that at all. It says all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine. Amen? For reproof. And the best way to look at what's doctrine, what is right? Reproof, what is not right, amen? Uh, correction, how to get it right. So you take what's not right, and this is how you make it right. And for instruction in righteousness, how to keep it right. Now, I simplified very four terms that you could look into very deeply in each one of those words. You come to the conclusion that the Bible says that the, that the Scripture is all-sufficient to counsel in every area of life. Amen? Now, I'm not going to get into the debate about psychological problems that are caused uh, from chemical things going on in the head. That's another issue. But for a majority of people today, biblical counseling could get rid of a lot of problems. In fact, uh, one psychiatrist said, uh, if it wasn't for, uh, for guilt, we'd be out of business. He said 90% of his, his uh, uh, clients were there because of guilt issues. Well, you know what takes care of guilt issues is the Word of God. How do I get on guilty? God. <laughs> He's the one that declares you not guilty. Amen? So all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, complete, we're not talking about sinless perfection, but complete. He, he's perfect. Thoroughly, not thoroughly, it's throughly. The word is throughly. Throughly furnished unto all good works. From the inside out. Throughly furnished unto all good works. That means the sufficiency of Scripture to guide and direct a person's life is all a person needs. But they have to believe that this is the Word of God. Most Christians, they believe that this is the Word of God in theory. Right? Because, come on now, if you really believe that this is the Word of God, then you would take serious what it says. And people don't. 
people try to still mix bag it with uh, secular humanism and secular psychology, and, and you can't do that. So there's no such thing as a psychological problem. All personal problems are either spiritual or physical. Spiritual or physical. So most people don't understand a couple of things. Most people don't understand the nature of man and the power of sin. Right there. Right there is the big problem right there. Most people do not understand the nature of man. They think man is basically good and sometimes does bad things. That's not true. Man is rotten and sinful to the core. He is totally deprived. He is wicked, ungodly, unholy. I, I was really proud when I heard Luke preach on Sunday night. And when I heard him talk about the condition of man, about how ungodly we are, he, he only took about 10 seconds to, to what he was talking about there. But man, it was so true because nobody today wants to come to grips with the fact that you're not as good as you think you are. And the power of sin. The power of sin. They don't know about the power of sin. That's why people are addicts, because of the power of sin, because of the nature of man and the power of sin. But if you know the truth, what? The truth will make you free. See? Now, are those just words, or is that just makes good preaching, or is it true? That's what we got to come to grips with. The people at Rome, they were filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another because they believed that this word was true and sufficient. And they could have done the same things that we do today. They could have said, well, Aristotle says this, and Socrates said that, and, and, and Pluto, is that the other guy's name? <laughs> He said, you know, they could have ran that gambit because those guys are what people believe today. And in colleges and universities, secular colleges and universities, they teach that stuff. It's just absolutely incredible. And so, anyway, we, we haven't changed a whole lot since the time of the old Roman Empire. We've just got more technology, which I don't even know that that's a good thing. It is a good thing from one perspective, that Jeremy showed me that how it, I could call Pamela and if she's got her cell phone, we can see each other. That's the only good thing with technology right there. The rest of it, you can trash it all. Amen? Amen. Uh, all right. So, uh, I don't know why I wrote Colossians 3, 12 through 17 down, but let's just take a look at that real quick. And we'll, we're about done with this for tonight. See, I knew we weren't going to get out of verse 14. You guys are like, oh, the way he's been lately, we're out in five minutes. <laughs> Disappointment. All right, so Colossians 3, verse number 12. All right, Colossians 3, verse 12. Put on, therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. Now think, before we look at these other verses, those two verses right there, if Christians took serious. 90% of the problems in churches would be solved. Unbelievable, isn't it? But Christians don't take serious the Word of God. And they can't take serious what's not being taught either. So, Verse 14, And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your heart, to the which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word, this was the verse I was looking for before, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The word of Christ. The only way that can happen is by being in the word of God and getting it in here. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. It's the same word that he uses to the Romans. Teaching and admonishing. Teaching and admonishing. What's the basis of my teaching and admonishing? My basis is the word of Christ dwelling in me richly. Amen? So, uh, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another 
and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. What a powerful passage of Scripture, but it it, it coincides with what he said to the Romans uh, and this whole thought of admonishing one another and uh, and doing it with Scripture, songs and and hymns and spiritual songs. Our our songs should be a a way of admonishing and gaining hope and praise. and, and, uh, And sometimes it's hard. Our hearts are breaking and it's hard to sing because our hearts are breaking but we know that what we're singing is true. Amen? And, and I don't want to be nitpicky, but I don't get, I don't see how rocking it out for Jesus fits into this. Amen? Amen. I'm just forever always going to be uh, opposed to the uh, contemporary Christian music movement, but that's, that's me. So, All right. Uh, grace in your hearts to the Lord. And so in whatsoever you do, and word or deed. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. All right, so when God's word rules in our hearts, His Holy Spirit makes us rich and true in the true wisdom of God and prepares us to admonish to one another and to teach and help one another along the right road. Amen. Praise God. Uh, any questions? All right. Let's go in the Lord in prayer. Father and God, we thank you for this time together. And we just pray, God, that your word would just really sink deep in our heart, take root, and bear fruit. Father, we need you in a very special way. So many uh, in our church, so many families that people know uh, that need you in a desperate way, God. And I pray, Lord, that your life would be seen through ours. I pray that you'd manifest yourself to people in a very powerful way, that souls would just give their heart and life to you, and that saved souls would take serious or walk with you. Please, God, work mightily for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, I did not.